A young woman is studying for her university exams. Two police officers are on a routine patrol. And a car has run out of petrol as a family heads home from a party. Their journeys were about to intertwine. We had two names, but one was a real person that we were starting to look for. I've no doubt that there would have been significant loss of life. He made no secret of the fact that he was in Melbourne. He stood out because he was eating so many lollies. Although he had had the bonnet up, he paid no attention to the engine at all. He definitely had something to do with it, but he may have been the target. Everything that possibly can be done will be done. The way he said goodbye, he didn't just say, see you later or anything like that. He actually had a long handshake and said you know, goodbye. It was the perfect plan, foolproof in every way. But what was to be fail-safe in the operation of this crime was to be its undoing. As forensic specialists and detectives were about to discover, this was no ordinary investigation. Terrorism had arrived in Melbourne. we just finished doing some licensing duties at a hotel in Punt Road. And we're at the front talking to the licensee. And I heard an almighty, the almighty explosion. And of course, the first reaction was just to sort of say thunder. And uh, we giggled a bit and looked up, and it was a beautiful, clear sky with a million stars. And uh, immediately just reached into the police car and, and called on the radio to communication centre. Just reporting a large explosion sound down Punt Road. Know what's going on. And told them what I'd heard. And at that time, they were just getting the first calls in. Get in, mate. We've had a large explosion and we've got all the windows rolled completely in. They said there appeared to have been an explosion at the corner of Caroline Street and Turak Road in South Yarra. I'm coming with 2007. i And as we drove down the street, couldn't see anything at the beginning, but of course, the closer we got, the headlights picked up, glass and debris all over the road, and I could hear the other police units arriving in the street. And of course, the fire brigade by this stage have arrived too. There were a number of different fires burning. There was mass damage in a lot of shops. The helicopter was hovering overhead, providing some light. There were certain reports across the police frequency. Some suggested it might have been a gas explosion. Some suggested it might have been a bomb. We have a smell of gas. Oh, was it a fire that had set off something inside a, a process? And I think there was a dry cleaners on the corner there too. That could have been something to do that. We really didn't know what we were facing in that time. In the early stages of any major crime, Chinese whispers are a real problem, and by the time it filters down to the investigators, the stories are obviously exaggerated, so you're going with a reasonably open mind. Fire evacuation system to be put into effect. Someone yelled out that there was a person down the laneway, and I could see the silhouette of a person in the flames, it's against the flame. We raced over uh, to get the person, it was a young female and she's very distressed at that stage, and uh, I think she could hardly even speak to us. But uh, she was able to tell us that she was a, a student, a university student, and been studying in one of the office suites above. When the explosion went off below her, she didn't quite know what had happened, and she, in fact, had fled from the premises and hidden in the laneway where we found her. Get around this side. We took her down and handed her over to the ambulance crew, and then went back uh, to evacuate the people to make the scene safe and keep the crowd out. 
happen because we're always got to be mindful of a secondary explosion. It was pretty clear that something had happened. We weren't sure exactly what it was, so we set up a crime scene and called in the relevant experts that we believe were required for the job. The arson squad, the armed robbery squad, the major crime squad were all located in our vehicles and told to remain in, in a perimeter. Just get them out of the city, just keep them well away. And there are uniformed people standing there directing traffic and reasonably exposed. So we're also protecting their welfare because you still don't know if it was a criminal act and whether there were offenders still within the crime scene. The Special Operations Group had a very important job to do to declare the crime scene safe. As I approached the building, I observed a large amount of debris from the structure itself. I've inspected the small shop that suffered extensive damage and from the damage to the shop I'm able to ascertain that the blast occurred from behind the shop uh, because all of the debris has come out towards Caroline Street. I've continued on in past the shop into the building I've observed the remnants of what appeared to be a motor vehicle that had suffered catastrophic damage as a result of the blast. It appeared that the vehicle was either sitting on top of or very close to the explosion or the explosion occurred inside the vehicle. Everything does point to a bombing. It's certainly not what you would think would happen should an LP gas tank in a car explode. So to me, from my experience and seeing other explosions in vehicles, this fitted the bill of a criminal act. And it was obvious there'd also been a person in that scene at the time of the explosion. When the blast rang around the fashionable streets of South Yarra this morning, the story seemed to be one of a lucky escape. A 22-year-old woman studying on the third floor of the five-storey building escaped with only a scratch to her hand. But late this morning, the story took a new and horrific twist. Assistant Commissioner for Crime, Paul Delanus, announced that human remains had been found in the wreckage. Uh, the, <coughs> the body is in uh, hundreds of pieces. The remains I found were definitely those of someone who was extremely close to the device when it functioned, but it was far too early to suggest that that was uh, the bomber. We had no idea whether he may have been the target. It might have been his car, and when he's gone to his car, uh, the devices function. So he definitely had something to do with it, but what role he played in it, it was far too early to determine. And of course, when we were told that, well, that certainly elevates the level of the crime. You know, we're dealing with a murder effectively. The car that carried the suspected bomb had caused damage to a number of shops and businesses. But it was the address of one on the first floor of 44 Caroline Street that was significant. A briefing was held, and in that briefing we were actually told it was a suspected terrorist attack and that the premises involved was the Turkish consulate. The intelligence officer said to us that a person with Armenian background would be likely to be the suspect at this stage. The Armenian people were very aggrieved that the Turkish government would not acknowledge a genocide against the Armenian people, which happened back in 1915. And they said back in 1980, six years earlier than the bombing, the Turkish Consul General was shot dead. The killings took place shortly before 10 o'clock this morning. As the Turkish Consul General, Mr. Sariak Ariak, was pulling away from his driveway, two men on a motorcycle sped up the street. Mr. Ariak's bodyguard, Mr. Engen Sever, travelling in a separate vehicle, was first to get hit. Several pistol shots were pumped through the side window of his consular car. The gunman then ran to the Consul General's car and fired at least eight shots through the driver's window. Mr. Ariak was hit in the face and chest. He died instantly. Now, I wasn't aware of that, but just to think that there may be a link between the two cases was quite interesting because most of our crimes focused around what we call traditional crimes. So our perception was when we went into the briefing that 
we would be looking for some criminals. But at the end of that uh, briefing, I was quite clear this was a different investigation. About 40 minutes after Mr Ariak and his bodyguard were killed, a woman with a foreign accent telephoned Channel 7's newsroom and claimed responsibility for the assassinations. She said she was speaking on behalf of a group called the Justice Commandos of Armenian Genocide. The operation in Australia was done by Armenian revolutionaries uh, and Armenian revolutionaries strike everywhere. The woman said the group's attacks were aimed at Turkish diplomats and Turkish institutions and she warned that they planned to strike again. When we made our way to the first floor, which housed the Turkish consulate officers, the damage was quite extreme, quite severe. Had there have been any people within that area at the time, I've no doubt that there would have been significant loss of life. Do you think it will be some time before you identify, or do you think identification is impossible oh, under the circumstances? speculation at the, at the present time. Uh, We've got our disaster victim identification uh, people at the scene, so uh, everything that possibly can be done to identify the body will be done. The initial search that we made at the scene was an effort to locate something that we could use fairly quickly to identify this person. It was obvious that we weren't going to locate a finger to identify the deceased because the parts of the body were quite small. There was only two pieces of the remains which uh, had any size and they were the feet and one, f one leg of the uh, deceased. That meant looking uh, specifically for friction-rich skin from the palms of the deceased's hand. This skin is used by fingerprint personnel all over the world to identify people. As the crime scene team continued their minute examination, Another unit had found evidence that gave detectives a clue as to who the victim was. In the tons of rubble that was removed and examined, we found fragments of the detonator, of the timing device and of the mercury tilt switch. It was quite a sophisticated device and the sequence would have been to actually arm the bomb and then set a mercury tilt switch which was effectively set up as an anti-interference device. So if anybody disturbed it or moved the vehicle, the bomb would have fired, would have functioned. And we believed that the remains of the person that we identified at the scene was in fact the person responsible for planting the bomb. It's very likely this person was not fully aware of how the device functioned. In other words, he probably wasn't the builder of this bomb. Anyone who had made that device would have surely known that it needed to be placed on a level surface. So the person who planted that bomb was probably just the messenger. We don't believe it was a suicide bomber. It was an accidental detonation. The messenger's error had prevented many fatalities. But as he wasn't working alone, it meant future attacks could occur with success. So it was absolutely vital that police discovered who he was and in turn, who had been working with him. We asked the people giving us the briefings at the time, where do we start? And one of the officers said, look, a good place to start would be looking for somebody with a name that ends in IAM. A car bomb had exploded in the car park below the Turkish consulate offices. Its courier killed when it detonated prematurely. The blast wave had taken the least path of resistance and pushed all remnants of the car into the two laneways on either side of the structure. One of the special operations group members contacted us and they'd found a mangled registration plate of a car. So that gave us our first line of inquiry. Now, we, we did the normal uh, checks on the ownership of that vehicle, and it came up to a, an address over in Mortimer Street in Heidelberg. Now, of course, at this stage, we didn't know whether the owners of that car were implicated, whether it was, in fact, the bomb car. 
So we decided we would go straight to the address because it was our only lead at the time and our most important lead. We went out there and spoke to the people and it turned out that they'd advertised the car for sale and about lunchtime on the Saturday, Saturday immediately before the bomb, the man turned up and very quickly had a look at the car and bought it and drove off with it. Unfortunately, the two people that sold the car couldn't give us too much information at all, other than it was a Middle Eastern chap that he'd spoken to, and that was his description. There was no names or addresses obtained. Uh, what was going to happen was the paperwork would happen later on. So it really never gave us much of a lead at all. While it wasn't the primary crime scene, this suburban street now became a secondary one. The bomb car had been purchased here, and detectives hoped that further evidence or clues to the buyer's identity could be found. I think it was about two or three houses down from this address. I had just asked the occupants of the house, did you see anything suspicious around about this time? And the two ladies in the house at the time said, oh, yes, well, we saw a red car parked out the front of that house with the engine running at that time. And it was an interesting observation because normally you wouldn't notice those sorts of things. But one of the girls was waiting to be picked up by her friend. And when she heard the car out front, because it's a quiet suburban street, she went out thinking it was a friend. It wasn't a friend, so she thought, oh, OK, I'll wait here. So she sat there for some minutes looking at this car with its engine idling, which is reasonably suspicious in itself. She wasn't able to identify the person in the car, but she was very specific about how she described the car. It was a red Holden Commodore sedan, and it was either new or that clean, it was very new. So it may have been a hire car or something like that. It seemed more than a coincidence that these two separately witnessed events occurred at the same time. Was one the hapless messenger, the other his accomplice? While we were conducting the door-to-door -door canvas and, and obtaining statements from these witnesses, um, we'd received some information from other investigators that they'd uh, recovered a wallet at the crime scene which contained a, a bus ticket that had a name on it, Jacobson, and uh, it indicated that the person had uh, arrived in Melbourne in the early hours of Saturday morning. The bus ticket was a return ticket, and Mr Jacobson had a seat on the bus that was currently on its way back to Sydney. So we organised to stop the bus, and as predicted, Mr Jacobson's seat was empty. So that sort of suggested to us whoever was holding the Jacobson ticket was the person that was killed in the bomb. Like the buying of the Tirana, Mr Jacobson had left no contact details when the bus ticket was purchased. So with little else to go on, the detectives followed their gut instinct. Bearing in mind that we had this suspicion that perhaps this red car might have been a hire car, we thought, well, we'll just go and check out a couple of the hire car places in the vicinity of the bus depot. When we went to the budget rent a car office, I inquired as whether they'd um, rented out any uh, red Commodores. They were quite happy to give us the records. There wasn't that many from memory, but uh, as I flicked through, I saw the name Levon de Mirian appear on one of the loan agreements and it pretty well hit me straight away that that name that ended with an I-A-N was more likely than not an Armenian name. So straight away that actually gave us the first concrete evidence that we were on the lead um, and had a suspect's name. The other name, Jacobson, to us was just a, a name on an inventory, so we had two names, but one was a real person that we were starting to look for. We certainly thought that there was a possibility that um, Mr Jacobson could have been Demirian, but we didn't really know. It was very early in the piece. We knew we had a deceased person with a bus ticket in his pocket in the name of Jacobson. We knew we had apparently an Armenian person who'd hired this car from a budget. So things were starting to connect up and we're starting to have fairly positive thoughts about 
the fact that we may well have identified, you know, the potential offender for this crime. But another item in the wallet would take them in a totally different direction. The task force investigating the Turkish consulate bombing had discovered two names of importance. A Mr Jacobson, who had travelled down on a bus to Melbourne, and a Mr Demirian, whose name ended in the crucial IAN. But were they one and the same? In the wallet we found a docket with Queen's Lodge Motel written on it. And the person who hired the red car gave the name of Levon Demirian, gave an address of the Queen's Lodge Motel. So from that we made some inquiries. The night porter was able to tell us that Demirian was staying there, that he saw Demirian leave the hotel about 1am on the Sunday morning. And that was only an hour or so before the bomb went off. And then he was seen to return to the Queen's Lodge sometime around 3am, 3.15am. He also told us that when he came back at 3am, he booked an early morning reminder call for about 6am, I believe, and left shortly thereafter. And when he left, he dropped the uh, keys to the Holton Commodore at the front desk. So it told us, obviously, that uh, Demirian wasn't the deceased person, and it told us that he was out of the hotel between 1am and 3am, and, of course, the bomb went off at 2.15. I was very enthusiastic about that piece of evidence. Our inquiries revealed uh, that Levon de Mirian was a resident of uh, New South Wales. There was no criminal record either in Victoria or New South Wales under that name. But other inquiries with agencies outside the police indicated that he had some involvement with uh, organisations uh, tied up with uh, the Armenian groups. Within 24 hours of the bomb blast, Demirian was back at his home in Sydney and surveillance officers were there to greet him. Had the bomb gone off when it was intended on the Monday morning, this is where he would have been, totally unconnected. But it exploded prematurely and a trail of evidence was leading to his door. But without the detectives knowing who the dead man was, the evidence would mean next to nothing. They needed to know the true identity of Mr Jacobson so they could prove that he and Mr Demirian knew each other and had conspired to commit the bombing. During the course of the search at the scene, I located a number of pieces of skin. They were located in the north laneway behind the Turkish consulate building. They were probably no bigger than a five or 10 cent piece. They were just pieces of skin. There was no flesh attached to them at all. Obviously, we were hoping they had come from the palms of the hands so we could subsequently identify the deceased. Getting a print was a fairly easy process. It was just inked and uh, rolled onto a piece of paper. The prints were quite clear and contained enough characteristics to make a formal identification. With little computer technology available in 1986, fingerprint experts would rely on detectives to give them a name so that they could run it through their card system in hope that the suspect was on file. And at this point in the investigation, that name was more important than ever. We received information that Mr Demirian had been to a travel agent on the Monday morning and had uh, booked a airfare to Beirut and that Mr Demirian had shaved off his beard which of course straight away indicates an added degree of suspicion. The flight was to leave on the Wednesday morning on the 26th so it's now Monday afternoon and we're very tired. Most of us had been up since the Saturday morning. We know our main suspect is about to leave the country, but it was critical that we had to identify the person that had died. So we put a lot of effort into trying to identify who that was. 
So we needed to find out as much as we possibly could about uh, Levon, particularly in relation to who his associates were, and trying to find someone who's no longer there. Various intelligence agencies and, and, and investigators in New South Wales suggested it might have been a very close friend of Demirian's, a fellow by the name of Hagop Levonian. The investigators supplied us with Hagop Levonian's name for us to check off against the impressions from the pieces of skin. Our investigations found that he had not been recorded or fingerprinted in this country. Hagop Levonian was a quiet family man and worked as a jewellery setter. Had no criminal record. We spoke to his uh, workmates, who basically corroborated what we already knew about Hagop, the fact that he was a relatively likeable, easygoing sort of chap. But just prior to the bombing, he demonstrated that he was slightly agitated. When he actually left on the Friday afternoon, a co-worker said that he held his hand for a prolonged period and the way he said goodbye, he seemed to be very nervous. He didn't just say, see you later or anything like that. He actually had a long handshake and said you know, goodbye. And in hindsight, he said, was he saying goodbye or uh, we just couldn't work it out. It doesn't fit really because we knew Mr. Lavonian had planned to come back alive. So maybe they did know there was some risk involved. Uh, I'm sure carrying a, a bomb down on a public bus uh, is quite high risk. The detectives were now about to take their own risk and they hoped forensics would make it a safe option. If not, the investigation was in jeopardy. With their prime suspect about to leave the country and his associate and friend, Hagop Livonian, still not identified as the dead man, police decided to take a risk and raid their properties. They hoped evidence there would provide resolution to both problems. We didn't really want to go then. We were still early days with the investigation. The crime scene still hadn't been properly examined and we still hadn't collated uh, a lot of the evidence and material that we had to look through. But if we had have delayed going, he may well have uh, fled the country. And of course, once he got to Lebanon, that we'd never see him again. There was a lot of media out at the time, a lot of people pointing the finger at the Armenian people. So we decided to execute the warrants the following morning. The raids began at first light as dozens of New South Wales and Victorian and federal police converged on three addresses north of Sydney and one in Canberra. Their aim? To arrest a group of Armenians suspected over last Sunday's bombing of the Turkish consulate in Turak Road. A lot of evidence was seized at the time. There was a small book and it had the address of the Turkish consulate in Melbourne, uh, 44 Caroline Street, written in that book. And it had the names of the staff members. We found a lot of gadgetry and components and wiring that was similar to that used in the bomb down in Melbourne. In the drawer, they found a restaurant docket called the Pit Restaurant. It had Queens Lodge Hotel written on it and a phone number. And down on the bottom of that, in the right-hand corner, was the number 13. The significance of that was in the wallet that was found on the dead person on the bomb scene was the second copy of that receipt. I think we wiped the sweat from our eyebrows when we found that document because it really started to provide the nexuses that we needed. Another squad of police raided this Lane Cove restaurant owned by one of the Armenians from Epping. They seized documents and other items and scientific squad police began searching the premises for evidence linking it to the Melbourne bombing. The detonators and the explosives were the same ones that were used in the bomb down in Melbourne. As we searched the restaurant, we found an NRMA uh, holiday book. We opened it up and Queen's Lodge was circled. So there was just another piece of evidence connecting uh, Levon de Marin to the explosives and to the Queen's Lodge motel. This afternoon, three warrants were issued in Victoria for the extradition of 34-year-old Levon Demirian of Epping. 
He will appear in Sydney's Central Court tomorrow on three charges. They are conspiracy to commit damage endangering the lives of others, intentionally causing damage to property and using an explosive substance. He was taken into custody and a short time later I interviewed him. Levon admitted to me that he was actually in Melbourne at the time. He admitted to me that he did go and uh, hire the budget rent a car, paid with his diner's card, and he admitted to me that he went uh, with Hagop to an address in Heidelberg where they purchased the white Tirana. I think I suggested to him at that stage that Hagop might be dead. But he became very emotional, started to cry. About that time, he insisted that we get a solicitor for him. Uh, which we did, and from that point on, Levon decided not to make any further admissions or say anything in relation to the matter. But further evidence found by the police was clearly speaking for him. During the search of the Marion's place, we found in the rubbish bin a duplicate diner's club receipt. Now, written on the back were three addresses. The budget rent a car place in North Melbourne, also on the docket was the Antet Pioneer bus terminal. But a third address that was on the receipt gave us as investigators another very good line of inquiry, and that was the Park Royal Hotel down in Melbourne. The receptionist at the Park Royal was able to tell us that a person named Levon de Marian booked the room in his name. He'd, in fact, paid for the room on Sunday the morning after the bombing. We also discovered that Levon de Marion had paid for food and beverages. The manager of the restaurant was able to tell us that Levon de Marion had dined there the day before the bombing, that is a Saturday. And when we spoke to a food and beverages waiter who was working at the bistro, he identified Hagop Levonian as being one of the two men who dined together so what this clearly showed was that Demirian and Livonian were together at lunchtime on the Saturday preceding the bombing. Although Demirian had booked the room, our assumption was that uh, this person, Jacobson, or in fact, Hagop Livonian, had stayed in the room. Crime scene search revealed a very, very small part of the key in the remains at the bomb scene, probably about uh, one centimetre of a key. Now, that was actually matched to the exact same keys that are used at the Park Royal Hotel. So again, some more circumstantial evidence linking Demirian to Livonian to the bomb. But we still hadn't identified positively Hagop Livonian as the dead person. And it was incumbent upon us for the trial to do that because for the conviction of Levon Demirian, we had to prove who Hagop Levonian was, so the jury could then say these two men conspired to commit the bombing. When they were searching Levonian's place, we found a jacket hanging up in the wardrobe that proved to match a sample of material that was found at the bomb scene. So there was uh, evidence there linking uh, the trousers and the person that was wearing them to that jacket that was found in Hagop Livonian's wardrobe. There was no fingerprint record of Hagop Livonian, so we had to rely on other means to identify the piece of skin. What we needed from the investigators were documents specific to Hagop Livonian that he would only have touched, so we could compare the impressions from the documents with this piece of skin. Numerous papers, documents and books were seized in hope that one may contain a clear palm print of Hagop Livonian. My task then was to physically sit down with the inked impression that I had of the pieces of skin at the scene and compare them to the palm prints on the documents. One of the documents that was received from the raids was a large receipt book. There were good palm prints on the back of the pages on the receipt book because the receipt book was quite thick and you had to really force the page down in order to hold the book open. So there were quite good palm prints on the back of a lot of the pages in the receipt book. The print on one of the pages looked promising. When I had a good look at it, I realised that the piece of skin 
that I had located in a lane way was in fact the same print that was on the back of this invoice book. He was the only one that used that book. So the person that was blown up at the bomb site was in fact Hagel Blavonian. Detectives now had the proof of identity and a list of circumstantial evidence that would link Livonian to the crime. But it was the watchful eye of an eight-year-old boy that would be the icing on the investigation. Something beginning with R. Within 72 hours of the bombing, detectives had numerous crime scenes stretching from Melbourne to Sydney each scene linking their two suspects, Hagop Livonian and Levon Demirian, to the bomb site. Now another scene, only moments away from the consulate, was added to their impressive list. The family on the 22nd of November had driven from country Victoria to attend a party. They left that party later on that night uh, in the early hours of the following morning. The vehicle that they were in had run out of gas. So I just stayed in the car with my mum and dad saw a 7-Eleven down the road and so he, he walked off down the road. Not long after dad left, a white Tirana pulled in behind us and parked pretty much directly behind our car and the man hopped out. He opened up the bonnet as if he'd broken down. He was fairly well dressed. He had straight hair, probably down to about his ear level. He's wearing glasses at the time. And his skin was, was sort of olivey colour, which probably stands out to me now that he was probably of a different, different nationality. And I thought it was a bit unusual because although he had had the bonnet up, he paid no attention to the engine at all. And it wasn't much time at all before another car came in the opposite direction, did a U-turn and parked directly behind the white Tirana. Then the other guy hopped out of the car. I can remember he had really bushy, big hair and a moustache and they started talking. Couldn't understand them at all. It was as if they were speaking in another language. Me and Mum were playing a game at the time. I think by playing this game with my mum, that's probably how I was able to remember so much. I can remember talking about the number plate, being a black and white Victorian number plate with Victoria written up the top and um, that it had two fours in the number plate. And I knew it was a white Tirana at the time because my grandma used to have a Tirana as well. When my dad came back from the petrol station, I can remember looking at the two blokes standing at the back of the Tirana in the boot. The guy who owned the white Tirana was actually showing the guy that had come in the other car something in the boot of the car. After um, Dad put petrol in it, there wasn't enough to get the car started. So Dad went back to the petrol station. This time I went with him. The petrol station was probably about two or three blocks away. And I can remember as we were walking in to the 7-Eleven store, that's when we heard an explosion but paid no attention to it at the time and meant nothing. And then we got enough petrol, we walked back up to the car, the two blokes had left, both the cars had gone then, Tirana and the red car had gone, drove down the road, turned around a corner, there was fire engine police everywhere, there was heaps of smoke. At that point for me, being eight, there, there, was, there was no connection whatsoever. And it wasn't until we got home the next day that we'd seen that there was a white Tirana advertised on the TV. I recognised it straight away from the car that was parked behind us, and so then we rang the police. Police have alleged that Livonian and 34-year-old Sydney chef Levon Demirian planted the bomb under the consulate building in Caroline Street and that Livonian was blown to pieces in the explosion. The bomb car is claimed to have been a white Tirana bought the day before. And today a family told Demirian's committal hearing they'd seen a similar car in South Yarra only minutes before the blast. Well, this eight-year-old boy, his integrity oozed. You could see that he was very truthful. He had no reason to tell lies. He could recall that the registration number had uh, two fours in it. And in fact, the bomb car had the registration number with the numerals 440. He was able to give a very good description of the drivers of both cars and later pick out Mr Livonian from a photo folder and identify Levin Demirian at a court hearing. This was very important evidence because it was evidence outside of police evidence. It was independent eyewitness events. So how do we think the whole episode unfolded? Pretty much we believe Demirian was the prime mover behind the organisation of it. Mr Demirian was quite openly in Melbourne. 
and we believe that he was establishing an alibi for himself because I believe he knew that he was always the subject of interest by other agencies. I don't think he was silly enough not to know that he was a suspect. So his plan was to remain quite open. Hagop Lavonian, on the other hand, was to come into Melbourne and bring the bomb down on a bus under an assumed name of Jacobson. I think we probably had seven or eight witnesses on the bus that positively identified Hagop Lavonian. He stood out, not so much because of his appearance, but more so because of his demeanour. I recall one lady saying that he stood out because he was eating uh, so many lollies and, and probably, obviously, his nerves. Of course, Levon de Marion admitted hiring the Red Commodore and picking up Hagop Levonian from that bus terminal. The detectives believed that after buying the Tirana, the two had lunch together, and it was probably at this time that they swapped cars. Demirian then putting the finishing touches to the bomb before meeting his friend Hagop Livonian for his final instructions. And then Hagop actually took the white Tirana and parked it in the uh, rear of the Turkish consulate. When he alighted from the car, he went to the back of the car. Then Hagop Levonian has sat the bomb in the bag on the back seat, but instead of sitting it flat, well, he sat it flat, but it, the seat was on an angle. And as soon as he put the detonator into the bomb, because it was not flat and level, straight away it's detonated. The fail-safe part of their plan had been the item that had led investigators to piece the puzzle together. Had Livonian not tripped the mercury tilt switch, the case may have never been solved. Miriam was charged with murder, uh, conspiracy offences in regards to injuring people and damaging property. Back 20 years ago, there were no specific charges in regards to terrorism, so they were pretty well much just the straight charges out of the Crimes Act. During the 13-day trial, the Crown alleged that the accused Levon Demirian and his friend Hargob Livonian conspired to blow up the Turkish consulate because of an act of genocide against Armenians early this century. Demirian's defence counsel, David Galbally, alleged his client was deceived by his best friend and knew nothing of the plan to blow up the consulate. The jury of six men and six women began deliberating just before midday today, but just before five o'clock, the foreman indicated a verdict had been reached, guilty on both conspiracy and murder. Demirian must serve 25 years. The 10 years for conspiracy will be served concurrently. Mr Justice Kate gave an unequivocal warning of similar penalties to all others who might be tempted to conspire to commit acts of terrorism. Levon de Mirian, who became one of Australia's highest security prisoners, appealed his sentence. The conspiracy charge was upheld. The charge of murdering his best friend was quashed. Levon de Mirian was not offered an early release and served 10 years in prison.